man, I think she has the ability to, to transcend the sport. I also think she has the ability to be the greatest uh, grappler uh, on the planet, regardless of male or female. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another Bulletproof for BJ podcast. I'm JT, I'm here with Joey, and I am blessed and super excited to be here with the legendary Jake O'Driscoll. Jake, how you doing, brother? Uh, really good. Thanks for having me, guys. It's uh, a long-time listener, obviously, and we've been friends for a long time, too. So I'm really uh, blessed myself to be on the podcast and uh, share a bit of my story and have a chat with you boys. Mate, excited. You're an OG of, um, of Bulletproof, bro. You were, um, you were using our program back when there was like three people using it. <laughs> yeah. True. And you, yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I think yeah, still I probably one of the most it. diligent of all students. <laughs> yeah, when I stumbled across it, I knew I had to get involved, man. I knew you guys were... We're about to change the game, and uh, I was lucky enough to be uh, one of the early guys on there and uh, still support you guys as best I can and obviously support some of the athletes I work with, which is always – we're so grateful and appreciative of that. Look, man, I think it was – it's one of those things. Sometimes you get someone who's kind of ready-made walking in. I remember yeah. <laughs> just seeing, like, clips of you deadlifting, I don't know, 200 kilos or some shit. I'm like, yeah, yeah. what? Isn't this guy a lightweight? What the yeah, hell? Yeah. yeah, I did like, have a bit of powerlifting background, man, which uh, has definitely helped now I'm getting older. I don't have to cut as much weight as maybe some guys. But, uh, yeah, it's definitely a, a while ago. I don't know if I could do that anymore, but definitely back in the day. So, look, man, the way I'd like to start is because obviously you operate on so many levels. You're, a, you're an athlete. You're a competitor. You're a coach. Uh, you're a gym owner. You've done so much. And... You know, for people who are not familiar with you, how did you get started in BJJ? What got you on the jiu-jitsu journey? Yeah, like, like most Aussie kids, man, I played football basically my whole life. I uh, started from a young age and uh, was able to work my way up to uh, a semi-pro level playing in the state league and, uh, and things like that. And I just always assumed I was going to play in the AFL and make millions of dollars and have a pretty cruisy life. And uh, my draft year came around and... I sat down with a couple of clubs. I, I had a manager and, you know, I probably wasn't playing uh, the best football, but I still, you know, had this belief that I was going to get drafted. And, you know, draft day came and my name didn't get called. And uh, my manager basically said that the, the feedback was I wasn't fit enough. Um, I know that now that that's a very easy way of clubs letting you down because, you know, they don't want to hurt your feelings or whatnot. You know, I'm five foot six, so I would not last in today's AFL. Um, but, you know, I was like, okay, I didn't, I had two ways to take that, you know, whether, you know, crawl up and just suck about it or get fitter, you know, and I thought, well, that's easy. That's, that's the easy thing to do. So I went and started boxing. We hired a, a private boxing coach here in Perth and uh, I was doing lessons and stuff, trying to get my fitness up. And he was just like, one day you should, you should roll jujitsu with these guys. And I was like, I'm not doing that, man. That looks stupid. And he's like, no, no, it'll, it'll help. Like it'll really help for football and it'll get you fitter. And I ended up rolling with, um, a purple belt who's uh, actually owns a local gym near me now. We're still great friends. He was my coach for a long time, Ramel Luistro. He just had his first uh, guy signed to the UFC, Cody Haddon, on the weekend. And he's got another guy tomorrow competing on Dana White's Consender Series, Quillen Selkield. Um, and he just destroyed me, man, beat the, beat the crap out of me. And I was like, I need to do this. And I actually just quit football instantly, um, went straight into doing Jiu-Jitsu full time. And, you know, my family were pretty upset. They was like, thought I had a quitter mentality, like you, oh, you didn't get drafted, so you, you having a silk and whatnot. But I just knew, like, I could do this for the rest of my life, and and it would make me happy. Um, and obviously, back then we don't have the resources we have now, so it, it definitely did seem like a, a pretty stupid idea at the time. Uh, but <laughs> it's worked out. So what can I say? So what what year was that, mate? When was that? 2010, so end of 2009, 2010, uh, I was 19, 18, 19, around there. Um, I started in a, a small school that was more self-defense based, like not competition jiu-jitsu at all. Um, obviously did most of my career in the gi, you know, only took the gi off a couple of years ago when more opportunities came around um, and no gi started to get a little bit bigger. Um, so basically training the gi my whole career. And then um, I just, I moved around a little bit. I went with Ramel for a while did a little bit of the MMA thing. And um, then I had a couple of black belt coaches, uh, Brazilians, they ended up leaving. So then I had to find another gym and it was bounced around for a while, man, until I was able to open my own spot and really get some uh, regularity in training and, and things like that. But um, I wouldn't change anything, man. I lived in America for a while. You know, I was able to 
get some opportunities over there. And that as a young kid, that was, uh, you know, life changing. It set me up for where I am now. And uh, it's just very lucky, man, in terms of uh, right place, right time and right work ethic, I'd say. Did, um, so you had kind of aspirations to be a, a professional football player. Did you kind of, like from what you said then, it sounds like you just sort of transferred that dream across to a different sport, which was jiu-jitsu. So were you looking at jiu-jitsu and thinking, I want to take this all the way? Yeah, like uh, kind of, man. So when I was playing football, I was very lazy and not lazy in terms of like uh, the physicality or, or training or anything like that. You know, when I played in the state league, we had to train seven days a week. So we were there at the club every day. Tuesdays and Thursdays were optional. They were lifting days, but I always did them. I was always there early, but I was lazy in terms of pushing myself. You know what I mean? Like if we had to do a 2K time trial, I would always put myself just below the fir- the guys at the front and just in front of the guys at the back so that the coach didn't yell at me. You know what I mean? I was <laughs> never trying to get the best time or, you know, anything like that. So when I switched from football to, to jiu-jitsu, uh, my mentality switched. I was like, you kind of half asked that and that's what you deserve. You know what I mean? Um, I'm not going to do that anymore. So when I switched yeah. to jiu-jitsu, it was really like, you know, it wasn't really an athlete sport at the time. It was really like, a, you know, the lifestyle was pretty chilled and, you know, you, you did hard training, but no one really did anything off the mats or looked at your nutrition or your strength and conditioning. And I was like, no, I'm not doing that, man. Like, I'm, I'm going to treat this like a professional. And, you know, I copped a lot of flack for it as a, as a kid, you know, like, what do I know? I'm a blue belt trying to train like a professional when there's black belts that aren't doing that, winning world titles. Um, but I just believe that, like, that was not even competition success-wise, just life, you know. I thought that was what was going to set me up in life really well. And, you know, that was what was going to put me in the, in the best spot to do, achieve what I want to achieve. So I tried to do that as consistently as possible over a long time. You know, obviously being a, a younger kid in your early 20s, I was still partying, I was still drinking, or I was still going out with friends. And, you know, I wasn't professional in all aspects, but I was slowly getting better at it uh, to a point when I, you know, probably when I had my daughter is when I really made that switch when I was 25, uh, where I was like, okay, now it's time. Like, I'm not doing this anymore. I'm either going all in or or I'm just going to go and do something else, you know? So um, that's really, really helped me now. And so for you with that mentality, that kind of professional athlete mentality of doing the lifting and pushing yourself and all this, and maybe people around you weren't taking it seriously. You said that you trained predominantly in the gi for, for a long period of time. Yeah. What, what did that look like for you? Like you're in Perth, right? So you're in Western yeah. Australia, you know, cause obviously as Aussies, we all have to um, travel to compete, travel to, train at bigger teams or whatever it you know whatever it entails what did that look like for you coming in as trying to make yourself a professional slash a competitor yeah so i just tried to to follow the football uh schedule and like programming then so we had you know we had to do a certain conditioning in the morning and then at night we'd come and do our skill session and then on our lifting days and then you know friday night before the game we had to have a team dinner and eat pasta before a game and then sundays Mm -hmm. we had to go to the pool and do recovery so we're in the you know, run, swimming laps in the pool and, and stretching and all this stuff. So I just tried to do the same thing then. But instead of playing football, I just switched it for jiu-jitsu. So, you know, I'd wake up in the morning and uh, I, would, I would try and get either some drilling or some skill work in and then I'd go to school or go to TAFE because at the time I was doing TAFE because um, they didn't really have like a pathway for athletes in, in football to do anything other than get drafted. Now it's a lot better. They'll set you up with school, they'll set you up in an apprenticeship or they'll – They'll try and set you up if they think you're going to go to that next level. So you've got skills to, to fall back on. But we didn't have that. So for me, it was like, I'm not going to go to uni because the workload would be too much to play football professionally. I'll just chill at TAFE. So then I'll go to TAFE. I don't even know what I studied, man. Some sports degree, like sports certificate, I don't know. <laughs> and then I'd go to the club straight from TAFE, do extra running, extra kicking, do my skills. So I just did that with jiu-jitsu, man. And then uh, basically, I would we didn't have uh the ability to train as much as we wanted to because gyms didn't have jiu-jitsu classes every day they might have two a week or three a week so we would just we would just visit other gyms that had classes on the days we didn't have or i live with one of my black it's so funny i live with one of my black belts now uh chris parfitt and we just have mats in the garage me him and another one of my black belts simon um and we just train in the garage for hours you know what i mean because that's 
it was like, oh, this is how we get better. You know, the quantity was very high. The quality was very low. And slowly over time, I've been able to, to switch that up uh, really well. But at the time, that's all we knew. And we just did that, man. And I was very lucky to have those two guys not only uh, as best friends, but as training partners. And also, they never doubted my dream either. You know, it's very funny now. I can talk to those guys and laugh and be like, man, we've done this or I've done this. Or even with Adele on the weekend, you know, like we were talking about stuff like this years and 10 years ago, you know, and those guys really know like, okay, we were in the garage with 20 uh, millimeter jigsaw mats smashing each other. And now we're here. So um, I basically just tried to follow that module, man. And then as I got older, I would take from other sports and try and uh, implement that into Jiu Jitsu. Awesome. And so what what was the step where you were like, okay, I'm a competitor, I live this, this is this is life for me, jiu-jitsu is 100% what I'm about. At what point, because obviously, you know, you have your daughter and, you know, you're a great dad, I see you on the social media, all the stuff you do, it's, it's awesome, you know. Yeah. At what point do you go, right, I'm going to open my own gym? Like, when did Essence, when did that become... Uh, not only an idea, but making that a reality. Yeah, so it, this, this is going to be a funny one, man, because it, it wasn't, you know what I mean? I was just happy to be floating around at the time. And uh, the, the goal or the dream was always to open your own academy. I think that was the only way you're going to make any money. Um, but my uh, biggest thing was I had my family at the time, you know, Ava's mum and I were still together and we had Ava. I didn't ever want to open a gym and fail and have it affect them. So I wanted to build enough money in the bank or a por- uh, an investment portfolio or whatever it was that if I, the gym failed, they would never miss out, you know? So I was always just like, you know, when I eat, when I get 50 grand in my savings and then 60 and then 70, there was always, it was always like going to happen further down the line. And then one of my mates owned a CrossFit gym that I was training at and he wanted to open a bigger facility, but it was a bit tight in terms of where the money was going and whatnot. And he was just like, well, why don't you just sublease? X amount of area in the gym and then I can afford this and you can start your spot and go from there. And I think it was cost me 500 bucks a month. Um, so for me, I was like, well, five students will cover that. Worst case, I have my own spot to train 24 hours a day. So I don't have to answer to anybody or, you know, wait for the gym to be opened up with a key or something like that. And then that grew to, you know, I think 50 members when I moved into my own spot, you know, and then it grew to where we are now. So uh, what, what, so just for a timeline, Jake, just backpedal slightly. Yeah. What, at, at what time, did, like at what point did you start in your mate's CrossFit gym? Like what point in your jiu-jitsu journey and also what year? And then at what point did you then do your own thing? Like yeah, so, spot? so 2018, October 1st, so it's coming up to our sixth birthday, I think, uh, is when we started in the CrossFit gym. And I got my black belt in January of 2018. I was teaching at Scrappy MMA, which is, is notorious now for, you know, your Jack Della and um, and guys like that. Um, ben Vickers gave me an opportunity to teach there full time and I was loving it, you know. But then when I got this opportunity, I, I couldn't pass it up. And, you know, Ben and I are still uh, on, on good terms, you know. He knew I didn't leave uh, on bad terms and um, and got this opportunity. And then 12 months later, literally, uh, is when I got my own spot. You know, their CrossFit gym had grown to a, uh, so much that they needed the space. And my jiu-jitsu side of things had grown so much that I needed more space. So it worked out perfect, man. Like the, my lease was up with him or my sub-lease and he needed it and I needed it. So uh, we were able to find a, a gym right around the corner um, that I didn't even look at. You know, my cousin, uh, he owns a few businesses and he was helping me out looking for places. I was in Bali and he was like, man, I found this spot. Look, it's perfect. The rent's perfect. Everything's good. And I'm I'm pretty laid back, man. And I was just like, well, if you think it's good, like send the papers over, I'll sign them all good. And, uh, <laughs> and he did. And, and we're still here, man. So sometimes I feel like, you know, opportunity knocks and you got to take it. And then other, other things I'm super calculated on. Um, but yeah, well, I was very lucky with that, man. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah so, I mean, the, the crazy thing for me is like, um, I mean, I guess even like before social media, like it, I mean, social media has been around for a while across many different platforms, but, you know, I had awareness of you as a, as a competitor. Um, and then I just, I think I became more aware of you as an athlete. Like, this guy's a new unit. And that's why I was like, we need to get this guy on Bulletproof. Like, <laughs> yeah, we need yeah. to, re- like, recruit this guy somehow, you know? And yeah. so, mate, talk, talk to me because you still, 
you know, you're in great shape and you, you. you know, like you're training, you train hard all the time and yeah. you also coach. So can you talk to me a little bit about, or t- talk to us at least, like how do you, how do you juggle the, you're a coach, you're a gym owner, but also you still, you know, you're keeping yourself kind of competition ready, gas station yeah. ready. I mean, you just won the M16 uh, champion belt, like what, a, a month ago? Not even a month ago? Like Yeah, two days before. Talk we, about uh, that, mate. Flew out to America, so I didn't even get to celebrate it because Adele trumped me, but it's all right. <laughs> I'll get her back. Yeah, but yeah, you would know. Talk to me, mate, because you've been you've been you've been pushing for that goal for a little while now. Ladies and gentlemen, do you suffer from sore and swollen knuckles after a hard class of jujitsu? I have the answer for you: the finger team, custom designed by our friend the Grip Physio. Now, these wraps are specific for your fingers. Wrap them around, work them through, and reduce the swelling so you can recover faster and be back on the mats in no time. You can get 20% off when you use the code BULLETPROOF20 at checkout. Go to thegripphysio.com. Yeah, yeah, so, definitely. That, that, that's definitely one I wanted to tick off, man, and, and that was definitely one. I don't really focus too much on titles, and I know that sounds weird because I am a competitor, but I've never, I've never won a title that's uh, changed who I am as a person um, and how I am day to day, and I don't think I ever will. You know what I mean? And, you know, I obviously get to talk to Adele now after she's won ADCC and we laugh like nothing's changed as her, as her as a person and me as a person. You know, it's the same thing. Um, so they're more just personal challenges. Um, and as long as I'm validated in myself and, and what I do, you know, they, it, it, I don't really care if people think it's good or not. You know, I care and that's all that matters. Um, so if, for me, man, it's just time management, you know, like. Like you said, I wear quite a few hats. Dad will always come first. You know, like my relationship with my daughter, uh, nothing will get in the way of that. Um, and I'm very lucky that she's very understanding of what I do and she enjoys it and she she gets a, a certain lifestyle because of it. Um, but I tell the guys all the time, you know, like if I have to go to, not have to, but if I if she's got a school uh, event on and there's pro class on, I'm not going to be at pro class. You know what I mean? And that's just how it is. You know, that's priority for me. And I, I lay that out quite early. And I think as long as you do that, people will understand, you know, but if I was like, Jiu-Jitsu is everything, nothing comes in the way, and then I'm not rocking up because of other events, then I'm, I'm just talking smack, you know? So that's number one. But also just like, I love what I do, so I make sure I do it. So like today, for example, I knew I had this podcast with you guys at 9.30. I have to coach a bit later on, and then I'm teaching a masterclass tonight and to Tuesday's lifting day. Well, I need to get my lift in, so I woke up earlier. You know what I mean? Like it's it's actually not that hard, you know, just schedule it a little bit better than uh, what you usually would and then make it a priority. So for me, lifting today was a priority, you know, like watching Netflix or playing PlayStation, love to do it, love to read books, not a priority. You know what I mean? So if I don't get to play Madden today because I had to lift and then go work, it is what it is. You know, these these <laughs> things are priority for me. So I make sure that they're, they're textbook and, and I do them nonstop. Um, and that's how I'm able to, to keep up and, and still be in good shape, at, uh, competitive shape at, you know, 33. And I only feel like I'm getting better too, man. Like, I don't feel like I'm slowing down. I thought when I hit 30, that was it. You know, I was going to move on to something else in terms of coaching or career-wise in terms of business and et cetera. Um, but I've only started to get better because I'm a lot better with my time management. Um, and my guys know that too, you know. And I, to be fair, I don't do anything else. Like, I don't want to do anything else. I don't like anything else. I'd love you too. I don't force myself to do it. I don't force myself to study. I don't force myself to coach. I don't force myself to train. I want to do it. You know what I mean? And if I ever come across a day where I'm like, it's just not today, you know, maybe it's my mental health or maybe I'm just not feeling well or whatever, then I'll rest. And I think that's one thing I've learned a lot better now as I got older is I can have a day off and it's okay. Like I don't have to beat myself up about it. I don't have to kill myself over it and be like, oh no, I've had a day off. Someone's going to get better than me. You know, as long as I'm uh, ticking the boxes as, as often as possible, consistency wins over time. Mate, can you talk about um, like something I've observed with you and I, um, I'm sure, we'll, you know, we're going to go into it is like you have a mentorship that you run, right? Where I'm, I'm yeah. assuming you foster other um, aspiring athletes. Yeah. And what like what I'm what I've always found very fascinating about that, the stuff that you share around that 
is that you seem to have a very systemized and kind of uh, deliberate way of like coaching people and and bringing your best to the world of jujitsu. Yep. Um, which is really in counter to what we see in jujitsu typically, yeah. whereby yes. it's haphazard. Coaches are just like do the technique that i'm teaching yeah competitions like just compete more and you'll get better like no yeah, yeah. there's not a lot of people that are actually bringing like frameworks and support and accountability and structures to this thing so yeah. i've always been really struck by by you know the little bit that you share about that yeah. can you talk like i do want to hear about the mentorship break that down for us later but what i want to know is like where did you get the inspiration for that from and how did you start to develop this approach to to educating others. Yeah, so I just tried to reverse engineer like what the best uh, coaches and athletes in the world were doing outside of Jiu-Jitsu. I've never looked really inside of Jiu-Jitsu in terms of trying to copy someone's style or what they're doing, you know. Um, you know, Danaher's probably the, the most famous coach uh, in Jiu-Jitsu and I think he's incredible, um, but I'm not Danaher. So I don't want to coach like Danaher, I want to coach like me. So I just wanted to study as much as possible. So not only do I study jiu-jitsu, but I study athletes and coaches from other sports. I think we have such a massive resource in terms of, I'll use American sports as the best example, in your NFL, your NBA, your NHL, and tennis, you know, these kind of sports that have this framework and structure in place that these athletes are not only the best athletes in the world, but they're making millions of dollars and setting their families up not for life, for generation, you know, they're setting up generational wealth over time. Um, they're transcending sports, you know, they're, they're getting into the mainstream of, of life, you know, and I think that's where you need to look at for the athletes in jiu-jitsu because what the athletes in jiu-jitsu is they want that, but they don't know how to do it because no one in our sport is showing them how to do it. You know what I mean? So when we use Adele as the, the easiest example because of what she's done, you know, we turned her into a professional. She was always talented. I would never, ever take credit for her talent. But her ability to turn into a professional and everything she does was something we worked on massively. And I took that from you, Kobe Bryant, you, Michael Jordan, you, Tom Brady, you, Novak Djokovic, you know, you, Tiger Woods. And I'm only talking about their athletic careers. I'm not talking about any of their scandals or whatever. I never delve into that you know what i mean like yeah of course i have morals and values and i'm not going to agree with some <laughs> things but i'm only talking about them as their athletic prowess and then i look at coaches too you know nick saban's a, a college football coach that you guys would probably know of but not a lot of people would know of being an american american sport man i've studied so much nick faben uh nick saban footage and books and everything because he is the most successful coach so how did he do it you know what i mean and then uh, other coaches in that space too, you know, that I really dwell deep into that because I want to be able to give the best, not just to my athletes, but to myself, you know, and I want to be able to finish my career, whatever it is in June two, and be like, I had an impact and an impact is not winning titles. An impact is on someone's life, changing their life. And it could be, you know, something I say, something I do, whatever. But if I've made an impact on them and I've been able to help them, that's how I want to leave my mark. You know what I mean? That's what's the most important thing to me. It's very easy to say that when someone wins a title, you know what I mean? But I know that the impact I've had on Adele far transcends what she does on the map. You know what I mean? And it's very funny because she's been doing a lot of podcasts now and I listen to, to her talk on these podcasts and I'm so proud of her uh, in terms of the way she's able to handle herself and the way she speaks. But a lot of the mannerisms and a lot of the, the mental, mental work we've done together, it's coming through and I can see it coming through. And a lot of people won't pick that up because they don't spend a lot of time with her. And I don't need the validation from that, but I'm so proud that I'm having that impact. You know what I mean? On the, on, on such a, uh, a professional athlete. So, um, a lot goes into it, man. A lot goes into it. I never sit here and be like, I know all about jujitsu. Therefore, listen to me, man. I study all day, every day and every aspect. Could you, could you talk on some of the specific things you've done with Adele? Yep. Yeah, so Adele, Adele is obviously, like I said, she's very talented and she, she started at a young age. So everyone's always told her how talented she is, right? She started when she was 10. She started winning uh, a lot of big tournaments at Blue Bell. So everyone's telling her how good she is. Everyone's telling her, like, you're going to win this and you're going to win that. And, you know, at, at some point, I really believe she believed that, that it was just going to happen for her. You know what I mean? And Nogi Worlds last year, she lost in the final. And we had a real hard uh, conversation in my living room about how she is and, and how she acts and what she does. And, 
like, in my opinion, this is what she needs to do. And then we made a decision, you know, she either trusted what I was doing or she didn't. Either way, we're still friends. I still love her. But if she was going to take that next level, this is what I believe that she needed to do. And it was little things, man. So every training session that she does in lead up to, to competition or uh, so obviously ATC was the competition was completely scheduled out for her and programmed. So I would tell her, you need to do this, this and this today. You need to work on this, this and this. And then we don't let any excuse slide in. Oh, I didn't have the training partners today. Or I woke up late or, you know, the coach wasn't in today or, you know, whatever. No, that's, that's, you can control all those things. You know what I mean? So we do control all those things. So I've mentioned this before, like with her training partners, she knows who's going to be in the room and whatnot. And then if I need specific work, I'll actually contact her training partners for her and say, Hey, Joey, I need you to do this with Adele today. Don't tell her I said this, but when you roll with her, I need you to focus on this, this, and this. Now, whether their athlete does that or not, it's not under my control. You know what I mean? But, I feel like the people she has around her want to support her and help her so much that they do listen and they don't take it as, oh, Jake's trying to be controlling or he's trying to uh, be the man and be the face. I don't care. Like, it doesn't bother me if she, I, we talk about this all the time. I don't care if she ever mentions me on a podcast. It's not what I do it for. But I do it to make sure that she's at her best. So there's little things like that, you know, skill development for her competitions. If you look at her competitions leading up to ADTC, none were as impressive as what she did at ADTC. That was the point. Because we were making sure that when she came to ADCC, that was the best Adele we're going to get. So she fought a girl on Grapple Fest who's amazing, uh, Fiona. But we knew that she probably wasn't at the level Adele was at, right? So we tried a heap of different things, some passing, some mounts, some back stuff, getting ready for what you were going to see at ADCC. Same with mm. uh, Anna Rodriguez. Very boring match. Super boring. Exactly what we needed. Because we needed that. And we needed how Adele was going to adapt under that kind of pressure and that kind of boring match, which is usually super exciting for ADCC. So we look at the bigger picture, man, and not everything is about wins and losses. You know, it's, it's about getting to where she, she went to ADCC. So Adele wow. trusts me in what I do. And I give that trust back by working harder than anybody to coach her. You know what I mean? And I've said this to, uh, to JT and I've said this to, to other coaches I've worked with. You don't have to hold my hand. If you tell me you, you need this, this, and this, you know I've done it. Like there's, there's not even a question. You know I will do it if I trust you. And if I'm working with you, I probably trust you. Adele's the same. You know what I mean? I don't have to, when I tell her, hey, you need to work on this, I don't have to worry about, oh, no, she just went and did her own thing. I know she's doing it. And I can see it because I can see it in her improvement. You know, she obviously sends me videos and that so I can watch it. But I know when I see her uh, face to face, you know, we have a very like weird relationship is although I'm coach and student and it's friends, it's also kind of like big brother, little sister kind of relationship where like if she hasn't done something that I've asked her to do, I might not talk to her for a couple of days because she's so worried about like disappointing me and letting me down that she will go silent. You know what I mean? And she's used to that. So we've had to have those conversations where like, no, I'm not here to get mad at you. I'm not, I'm not going to yell at you. I'm not going to be mad at you. You know, you didn't do the right thing. That's enough. If you feel it, that you have to not talk to me or uh, exclude yourself from certain things, you knew you stuffed up. You know what I mean? I don't have to yell at you for it. And then what she'll do is she'll fix it. It won't happen again. You know what I mean? So like we take the professionalism to a very, very high level and again, I've caught flat for it in the past. Or why are you trying to, like, we have a pro class at my gym. Like, the pro, labeling yourself a professional isn't about the money you get paid. It's about the mindset you bring in to every single aspect of your life daily. That's what we focus on. So she's definitely got to that professional level. Do you find you get thirsty at training? I do. I do all the time. I'm a sweaty human and I need to hydrate. Now, the biggest problem is by the time you're thirsty, it's a little bit late. You need to hydrate. And that's why we got Sodi. Sodi is sponsoring the show. We've got all the colors of the rainbow. Great flavors here. We've got salty citrus, salty pineapple, salty berry, and my favorite, salty grapefruit. And they will be releasing two new mystery flavors soon. So why do we need this? It's going to prevent our muscle cramps. It's going to help our energy delivery. And it's also going to mean you're less tired which is an advantage when you're training. If you want to maximize your jiu-jitsu and feel good when you're rolling, you need to get Sodi. 
And when you purchase, enter the code BULLETPROOF20 at checkout for 20% off. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's awesome, man. I mean, can you talk to a little bit, because you're you are based in in Perth. Yeah. And I and so Adele Adele's partner is from Perth, is that right? Like at no, what point No, she's just, from Melbourne too. Yeah, she just studied is here. She? she just studied here. Oh, yeah. sorry. My mistake. So yeah. when she cause she was based in, in Perth for a little while, that's when she started working with you, right? Yeah, yeah. So they were here for they they came here during COVID. Um, so okay. I've been working with Adele for about four years now. Um, but I obviously knew her before that. Like she's like she's been amazing for a long, long time, you know. So I knew her yeah. before that. But when she came here, um, I actually kind of recruited her and not even for her. I recruited her for my partner at the time, uh, Bam Bam, who's amazing Bam Bam. in herself. Yeah, she's she's uh, amazing jiu-jitsu talent. I was like, this girl is your weight and better than you. If I can get her in the training room, she's going to help you. And then the friendship fostered and then the coaching relationship fostered and it worked from there. But yeah, I actually got Adele in the gym for – <laughs> to use as a training partner for someone else funnily enough <laughs> nice but uh, can you can you just quickly speak to the kind of um the management side like how you work the kind of online coaching relationship piece like you do with your mentorship like how do you go about that if somebody is somewhere else in the world whether it be within australia or not yeah how you engage with them and, and help them yeah, there's different levels, man. So obviously Adele would be at that that tier one level where I talk to her every day. You know what I mean? Every day I'm either on the phone with her, we're sharing text messages, she's sending me videos, uh, we're doing check-ins every single day. Um, so she's on that tier one level. And then underneath that, man, it's, it's very similar, but it'll be spread out a little bit more. So obviously uh, phone conversations and videos is going to be the easiest way to, to, to speak to people. I think that's the best way to do it. Um, and then just also, man, it, it does become a trust thing. So one of the, the things that I do with the mentor programs or being a mentor in, in itself is you need to have accountability and you need to take responsibility. And those two things are super important. I never work well with athletes that I need to hold their hand. It, it's just not going to work, man. Um, I know this because I know that I cannot coach everybody. I also know that I cannot be coached by everybody. You know what I mean? You need to find the right relationship for you and you need to fight. And that could be holding your hand. If you find a coach that holds your hand, that can take you to that next level. That's not wrong. I'm just saying I don't do that. So like when I work with the athletes, you know, you learn to take accountability for yourself. You know, like I know if you're doing the right things or not, because I can see it. You know, I have that experience in seeing the skill development. And if I've asked you to do something or I put in your program, hey, we need to focus on that. I can tell whether you're doing it or not. You know what I mean? Just like you guys would be able to tell uh, if you've asked someone to fix their technique when they're squatting. You know what I mean? If, you turn, if you've asked them to do a certain you know, adjustments in their squat and maybe their numbers go up, but their technique looks the same, you know they're not doing it. So you pick that up, right? So we do the same thing, man. So it's actually not that difficult to coach online. The difference is I'm not with you every day in the gym, but I did spend a lot of time with Adele in the gym. So we do have that, that relationship there. Um, but it's not that difficult to be fair because, again, I'm not trying to be your technique coach. I, I obviously can, but I'm not trying to just – like I didn't just give Adele techniques and she won 80 CC. That's not what happened. Like that's far, far, far removed from what happened. But it's a lot more to it, man. You know what I mean? And when I, I – to be fair, I try and just open those doors so that you can do it yourself. Like I don't really want to coach athletes like I do Adele. Like it's hard, you know what I mean, because it takes a lot, you know, and Adele has an amazing relationship – um, you know, with my daughter as well. So it's it's a bit easier because when I'm with her, I can bring Ava and there's no issues. Or if I'm doing an hour phone call with Adele, you know, Ava will be with me and they'll talk to each other and stuff. So that's that makes it a bit easier. Um, but it's also like it takes a lot of me to do as well. So I, I really need to make sure that the athlete themselves is giving back as much as I'm giving because I know what I'll give and it's a lot. Yeah. Could I ask you... Um... What's your, you know, you've obviously got some very well evolved views around coaching and in a, in a space like jiu-jitsu where things are often kind of stuck in the dark ages a bit, can you just give me some, some general thoughts on like, what do you think coaches could do better? You know, when you're looking at, at the approach, not even with elite athletes, but just, yeah. with, just with your standard jiu-jitsu person, where do you think they could improve? Yeah, I mean, just being more open-minded is, is number one and just doing more. 
And that sounds so, like it sounds so negative, but it's not, you know what I mean? What I mean by doing more is like, don't take your student, because in jiu-jitsu we have this like loyalty thing, right? And we have this like, this very team orientated environment. And, you know, you, once you, you come into my gym, you're only part of my gym and we do things like this. It's like, don't take the people in your gym for granted. You know what I mean? Like give them everything you've got. So like when you come to class, one of the main things I do is, man, I could be exhausted. You know, my, I talk about my mental health a lot. Maybe it's not great that day or, or whatnot. But when I teach you jujitsu, I'm going to teach you at the highest possible level that I can, because that may or may not be the last class I ever teach you. And I want you to be able to take something away from it that's helped you. You know what I mean? And again, technique is the base. So we spoke about this with uh, Adele. Hard work is the bare minimum. Don't tell me you're coming and working hard. You have to. You're a professional athlete. So as a coach, showing you technique is the bare minimum. You come in, I show you a technique. That's the bare minimum of what I need to do. Yeah, go above that. Help them out more, you know. Coach them while they're rolling. Give them a tip. Give them encouragement, you know what I mean? Understand the people in your gym or the people you're coaching. Some need hard uh, conversations. Some need a little bit, a little bit softer. I'm not... On all my athletes, sometimes I, I do, you know, give them a little bit more encouragement than whatnot. And others, I'll kick in the bum because I know that that's what they need. You know what I mean? So that was, it frustrates me sometimes as a gym owner, man, is like I'll get athletes or people come and visit or I'll, I'll visit gyms. And I'm not putting anyone down or anything like that. That's not what I'm saying. But like sometimes I just feel like you're just collecting people's money. And I'm like, man, I, I don't like that because I don't do that. And I would never want someone to do that to me. I never want to feel like a number when I go to a gym. You know what I mean? And you don't have to make the, the class all about me or, or anything like that. But I want to feel like you want me there and you want to help me get better. That's that's important, I think. You know what I mean? And then from an athlete's point of view, don't expect your athletes to give you 100% or, or try and give their all when you're not doing that. You know what I mean? Like if you want your athletes to be at a higher level and they're competing or whatnot and you don't want to go on a Sunday because you want to watch – sorry, that's the, the dog uh and you want to watch the you want to watch the football or you want to you know watch netflix oh yeah text me how you go or send me a video how you go why does that guy want to fight he's best for you you know what i mean like this is the role that we signed up for so you got to do what what in, is involved all the time you know what i mean you don't get to pick and choose which days you want to be the coach and which days you don't you know what i mean like again we, we talk a lot about adele she's an easy example the night before the finals one of our friends got us tickets to an NFL game and, Ooh. and I wanted to go. She got me a ticket <laughs> and she got her a ticket. I've never been. It was at Allegiant stadium. And I was like, sweet. So I said to Adele, Hey, this is what happened. And Adele was like, you know, I'd feel more comfortable if you stayed home and watched the movie with me. And I said, sweet. Sorry, man. I can, sorry. I can't go. Adele wants me to stay home. Oh, but it's only going to be a couple of hours. No, I get that. But this is what she wants. And this is what's going to make her most comfortable. So I'm going to do that. You know what I mean? Like you have to put yeah, the athlete yeah. first and it's, it's so cool. Important, she could, man. she could say that to you. Cause I'm sure like maybe, you know, it, it would be hard to say that to a coach in that scenario. Like, no, I actually just want you to hang out with me yeah. and so not we, do that thing. But that's yeah, we honest. Have, we, yeah. We talk, I mean, our relationship is great like that. It's, it's built on trust and honesty. And I joke about this all the time. She gets really jealous when I coach other people, but she does. <laughs> and we do have conversations that, you know, like, she obviously doesn't get jealous about the gym. The gym's a separate thing. But like I do coach some other athletes similar to how I coach her. And she very much is like, hey, I've got this coming up. I need your full attention. And we have that relationship where I'm like, okay, like it's it's beneficial for both parties in terms of I get to experience opportunities and get to work with a high level athlete. And she gets the coach that she needs for that certain time, you know? So uh, it goes both ways, definitely. Um, but it is very much like that too, man. It is a commitment to each other. And it, it sounds weird because she's she swings for the other team, but it is a is it a commitment? So, yeah. Just on on that, did you have any run-ins at all with Andre Galvão? Was there ever any like treading on each other's toes and like a moment of confrontation? Never. The second I walked in the gym, you know, he was amazing. He wanted me to coach the in the pro team uh, in the pro sessions. Uh, he asked questions. He asked for uh, advice on certain things with Adele. You know, when we're coaching the corner, he didn't uh, override me on anything. You know, it was it was great having him there prior uh, and after as well. He was amazing. You know, as soon as Adele won, 
the 55 kilo uh, title, he turned to me and said, coach, you got one. You got a champion. Congratulations. You know, and I thought that was amazing. Um, never at all, man. Never at all. And like, you're going to see stuff on social media about him posting and, and this and that. I've got a few questions about that. He should. So he should. She represented his gym. She did his training camp. You know, like, those are the perks that you get when you represent Atos. You get Andre Galvao and everything that comes with it. So yeah, if he's going to use social media to to help build his brand and the and the team and and whatnot, good. I fully support it. And then I got questions: Oh, why did you wear an Atos shirt and not an Essence shirt? Or you know, and it's just unnecessary, man. I know the relationship I have with Adele. Adele asked me to wear the shirt. Andre asked me to wear the shirt. I have my logo tattooed on my arm. I, it doesn't <laughs> matter. It don't matter to me, man. You know what I mean? It's it's so. Yeah, it doesn't matter. But no, nah, small stuff, amazing. isn't it? It doesn't and, mean uh, shit. He he is uh, genuinely a good person. That's very cool. And I, I asked that by the way. He seems like the most lovely guy. Yeah. Like yeah. when when you you look at his conduct, and we saw him racing from um, racing from ADCC to CJI. Yeah. yeah. Um, and just yeah, he seems like he like yourself is just fully invested in his students. He's he's fully invested in in them achieving their goals, which I don't think people understand the difference between them achieving their goals and him being the face. You know what I mean? So like, I talk about this a little bit. Like, Adele won ADCC. I didn't win ADCC. Now she'll push me to say I'm an ADCC champion coach and and capitalize and things like that. But I fully understand that Adele won ADCC and. She should be getting all the accolades that that come along with that. You know what I mean? And Andre is very much like that. Now he's going to get more notoriety because of who he is compared to like myself, but so he should because he's built his career doing that. When he was out the back and he had different athletes, Philippe Pena, Kainen, Hafeyala, uh, Adele, all in that training room, none of their coaches had to uh, answer to him in terms of like he didn't come over and be like, no, you need to do this or you need to do that. He was very much like, do you need me? Are we good? Okay. Okay. Well, what about this? Okay. Yeah. Have you considered this? Like it was very much back and forth. It was not like I'm in control and I have to be seen as in control at all. And uh, I took a lot from that, to be fair. I really watched, I'm a people watcher as well. So being backstage at ADCC, I was like watching what people were doing and things like that. And I, I picked up a lot from that, man. Today's episode was brought to you by Parry Athletics. They are our preferred apparel sponsor. They've been sponsoring the show for some time now and they do the best gear in the game. They do the best training shorts for the gym or on the mats and they always have awesome designs for all of their custom rash guards. Now, if you would like to get yourself some Parry Athletics gear, we can get you 20% off when you use the code BULLETPROOF20. That's right, folks. You get 20% off when you use the code bulletproof 20 get some you well mate look i think that's that's phenomenal i was really interested to understand because obviously we you know we back adele 100 percent. you know we've been working with her on on her snc program and you know i reached out to her about 18 months ago and just said hey what are you doing can we help how can we help yeah uh because obviously you know i've been aware of her for but yeah, since she was a blue belt and just seeing her rise and, and obviously knowing that she was, she was working with you as well. Um, we just want to get behind her however we could. And I know she's a, she's a, she's a beast. Like yeah. she, she does the work and really respect that. What I would like to know just from my, like just from my own curiosity, because we were at ADCC, we were at CJI yeah. and we had friends at both, events yeah mate please can you talk a little bit and give a bit of a behind the scenes because i got to go behind the scenes i was very lucky i was doing a little bit of work with fabio colloy yeah. who's a longtime friend of mine i was also doing his snc program leading up to the adcc so i got to be there backstage which was cool yeah but could you please talk about your experience being there the media the setup, like, because I, me personally, I, I and I, I, mean, I don't say this to color anything you're going to say. Yeah. I felt like the show was probably really good for the internet and for the audience in a way at ADCC, but maybe not the best for the athlete and the coach. Yeah. With, okay, coaches over here, athletes go there, that kind of a thing. Can you please talk about your experience as a coach, being there with Adele, run us through 
all of the everything yeah. and your take on what it was like to be there, Matt's side and experience all of that. Yeah, like I think it was a little bit different for us because we're obviously so like locked in on, on what we're trying to do. Um, I think one of the biggest issues, man, was the T-Mobile was such a, a massive arena. They obviously have their own uh, staff that run that arena year round. Uh, and that staff is, is used to a particular crowd and used to a certain way of running things. And due to people aren't, you know what I mean? So they were, the security were very strict on everything and there was no allowances made. You know, at one point I heard one of the security guards not letting Mo onto the floor. And he's like, what do you mean? This is my event. And the guy's like, yeah, you don't have, you don't have your tag on you. And he's like, yeah, that's my event. And I'm like, he's like, you know, the Craig Jones invitational. I'm the Craig Jones of this shit. Yeah. yeah I, was, I own, I pay the rent on this. Yeah. It, it was wild, man. But then they used to like dealing with the hockey crowd, you know, they used to dealing with concerts and things like that, where, you know, they're not everybody. You, we've got our own little famous community, you know, so not everybody in like the hockey crowd is going to have that, you know, that pull of like, oh, but I know so-and-so or I'm this person or whatnot. So I think that was very difficult for the athletes and coaches to deal with because you're constantly separated. You're constantly not allowed to be near each other. You have to walk at a certain time while your athlete walks at a certain time. And, you know, Adele and I have certain rituals and stuff we do before the match. And, you know, I had to get taken away from her at a certain time for, to, for her to walk out. And, you know, which wasn't ideal, but, you know, we dealt with it after, uh, you know, the, her first couple of matches, we, we, then game plan for that okay this is how it's going to work um besides that man like the the locker room was great you know there was a, a good energy in the locker room there was enough mat space for everybody uh day two we were in uh Kynan's locker room Kynan being the champion and, and one of the bigger names had his own space and you know we were very lucky that we were allowed to be in there and you know that was great seeing all the behind the scenes with that kind of stuff man um i thought one of the best things about the arena was like when I'd go and get some food or go and take a break or, you know, go and uh, soak up some of the atmosphere, like all the TVs had all the match running, you know, so you didn't have to miss anything at all. You know, I thought that was pretty cool, you know, because, you know, imagine missing Pixley throwing Marigali because you went to the bathroom, like you'd be devastated, yeah. but the TVs were everywhere. So like you, you weren't going to miss that stuff, you know? Um, so besides that, man, like I didn't find it too bad. You know what I mean? I heard CJI, uh, I would love to have gone. Obviously, big big fan of Craig. I've known Craig for a long time. Um, uh, I would have loved to have gone. Didn't work out just due to the fact that, you know, Adele had to weigh in. And then day two, like I said, she was, she was pretty keen on having me around. So, uh, But we watched it, and I heard the atmosphere was really good. I definitely do think a smaller venue is way better for atmosphere in anything. You know what I mean? Like, it's very hard unless you fill the T-Mobile Arena with 60,000. Are you going to get the kind of atmosphere that you're chasing? Like even with the UFC events, sometimes you fill an arena like over here, at RAC Arena in Perth. I think it's like, don't quote me, but let's say 15,000. You fill that and you get told, oh, the Perth's one of the best crowds in the world because it, everybody's around each other. You know what I mean? You spread that out over, yeah. six, it's, you know, not 60,000, but, you know, 25,000, let's say, but spread out. It doesn't seem as good. Um, yeah. But yeah, I, I enjoyed it, man. I honestly really enjoyed it and I enjoyed being there and I was I still pinched myself at, at certain points to be like, this is what I'm doing and, and where I am. And yeah, I enjoyed it. Can you quickly talk about, um, so obviously Del, Adele, she won the 55 kilo category. That was amazing. And the way she won the category, finished with the, with the mirror lock, amazing, right? Because yep. it was freaking fast. Yeah. And, you know, be a, you know, Bia Basilico is a, a maniac, so she's a super tough opponent. For her to finish her like that was great. Yeah. But then coming into Absolute, you know, obviously Adele is a small frame human. Yeah. From what we could see, right, like we're up in the stands, but it seemed, at least to me, the girls were a little bit scared of Adele. Like yeah, yeah. there was like apprehension, like, oh my <laughs> God, this this little bear trap of a human's going to snap me up you know because there was hesitancy which yeah. i didn't expect i thought there would be more aggression but it seemed like people were quite intimidated by adele's game yeah and can you talk to me a little bit about like one being that side coaching her through that and being her being the smallest person in the absolute yeah. and then two coaching against andre galvan in the yeah. semi-final talk about that sorry is that me i hope not uh 
Sorry. Uh, yeah, so... You're good. Yeah, absolutely, we actually didn't plan to do. We spoke about it, and then we're like, we'll make a decision after her weight class. Um, and, you know, Mo grabbed me after she won and just said, oh, you know, are you going to put her in the absolute? And I was like, uh, let me talk to her. Let me see what she thinks. And I just asked her, and she was like, well, what do you think? And I was like, look, you're injury-free. You had a great run. You were communicating really well, like between coach and student, like we're on the same page. And we may never be here again. We plan to be here, but we may never be here again. I think you should do it. And then she just looked at me and said, sign me up. So I said, okay, let's do it. And then uh, the bracket came out and it was pretty difficult. She had two friends first round and then she had, uh, sorry, uh, complete, uh, be a mosquito in the final, you know, and I had to go back and game plan for, for the route we were going to take, which is quite difficult. Uh, we trained with Brianna all week, they're best friends. Uh, we trained the whole camp with Hafliella. They're very close. And then obviously Bia as a, as a puzzle in herself. Um, the reason I believe they were so hesitant is because I have this thing, that this theory with Adele, or it's not really a theory. This, It's like when you fight someone in MMA and they have that one punch knockout power, right? You're always very hesitant about getting in range just in case you get clipped. Now, you might be 10 times more technical than they are, but they if they clip you, you're going out, right? Adele as a 55 kilo female has that ability as a grappler. When she gets a hold of you, whether you're male, female, or whatever size you are, you realize she's got a hold of you and she can break you. And it's different. You know what I mean? Like in the semifinal, Anna Rod and Bia both had really good straight foot locks. To be fair, like I, I felt like a little bit of difference and there could have been a finish, but there's no break. They weren't scared of breaking each other. They both just cranked, right? You can't do that with Adele. Adele will break your shit. So uh, I think when people grab her, the girls start to understand and realize, oh, hang on, I cannot make a mistake here because I will pay for it. You know what I mean? And I think, you know, Rihanna and Hafeyala training with her knew that, so they were a bit hesitant. And then I think when Bia grabbed her and realized that, Bia's got a pretty budding MMA career uh, happening at the moment. I don't think she wanted to take a break in in the ADCC final in in case you know what I mean so she was very hesitant because she was like if Adele gets something I'm in trouble here so that really played into that factor you know but uh Adele was 100% natty and has been a, her whole career which people don't talk about enough about how impressive that is not only being the smallest but she isn't taking any performance enhancing drugs um not knocking anyone that does but it, it definitely like if we're if we're, <laughs> them anyway whatever <laughs> if we are going to talk about you know like uh people doing it well we should congratulate the people that don't do it you know and she's uh she's one of them well said and i think that uh the, what really separated her too was her mindset she's been talking about this a lot on podcasts about how adcc the first one she did she was just happy to be there and this time she was happy to she was she was taking heads she was there to win you know and uh we had a real good conversation right before the final of the absolute where I won't go into too much detail, but we basically just were grateful of the spot we were in, but we weren't content, you know, and I saw a lot of stuff from, from Kobe Bryant. And I just said to her, you know, job's not finished. Like job's not finished. Obviously if she lost, I was still proud of her. Like she's amazing. And it was a great feat. But in that moment, that wasn't what the mindset called for. And I just looked at her and I was like, look, job's not finished. She said, job's not finished. And then we, went out there and she did what she did and she gets to be a two-time ACC world champ for the rest of her life minimum bro when she got on that minimum. when she got on that arm i was and yeah <laughs> yeah so, Come on. so it's funny like no one can find footage of her doing choy bars previous to adcc and that's something we developed about three months ago for her was hey do you do choy bars and she's like no and i'm like do you know how to do a choy bar she's like yeah I'm like, we need to start doing choy bars. So we really did, worked on that for, you know, a good solid three months because I felt like all the other aspects of her game led to the person using the, the opposite side arm to frame either on her wrist or on her head, which really set up the opportunity for a choy bar. And Adele's always been good at arm bars. So if she gets on your arm, she has an uncanny ability to keep control of your arm through scrambles. So I was like, cool, we need to add this. And then she was able to use it multiple times throughout the day, which is amazing. Um, but it just goes to show she can evolve instantly. You know what I mean? It doesn't take her years of evolution to get to that next spot. We can adapt very, very quickly. That's awesome. Cool, man. Yeah, it's, I, um, 
I was excited to see the overhook game in full effect, close guard overhook. Yeah. It was my go. It's kind of still there as a default. I think it's what I played for so long. Yeah. And then, I, you know, you, you fall out of fashion. Thing, things fall out of fashion, like yeah. close guard. Yeah. And then you see Adele just wrecking crew with it. Yeah. And you're like, fuck yeah, it's back. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think she's actually going to film a, uh, either for Submeta or, or BJ Fanatics, her, her system from there. And it's a, it's a really good system. You know, she's she's got it down pat. And that's one of those positions that I was talking about. When she gets the overhook, it's not like a normal overhook. You know what I mean? Like when she overhooks me, it's like I'm with someone in my own weight class, you know, and I've got 25 kilos on her. So like she, she has that power from that position to put damage on, which is, which is crazy. Epic. Yeah. Amazing, man. Well, I feel like, you know, obviously you're the, the combination of, uh, I mean, obviously everything she's, she learned, but you guys working together has created history, which is just, obviously it just makes us so, you know, whatever patriotism, like just Aussies, yeah, like, yeah, just yeah. like, it's not even that. It's just like friends, yeah. seeing your friends, do well at the highest level it's it's just the best yes and then also to see them beat the world's best it's like you already have it in your head like ah oh, you know we back her 100 percent. she's our girl we believe she can be champion but then to see it realized yeah and then everyone else is getting hype on it and you just see like the internet on fire yeah yeah it it's colossal and the only other moment I can compare it to for me is like when Lockie yep. kind of had his run for the bronze medal. Yeah. And I mean, that was phenomenal just because Lockie looks like such an average guy. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. all the dudes he beat were so <laughs> jacked. Yeah. Another example of someone who's natty beating, yep. uh, you know, some clearly enhanced humans. Yeah. No, no shade on them because they're just titans, you know, yeah, they're yeah. champions in their own right. But being there live yeah. and seeing it, it's like, is this happening right now? Like, did you, I mean, obviously you're there, you, you, you're in it. So you're business as hell, right? You're yeah. coaching. Yeah. But did you have like a little pinch me moment or were you like, holy shit, this is, this is, because it's possibly not repeatable other than maybe Adele yes. to do it again. But I yeah. don't think anyone else could repeat such a feat no, that's my no, take on. I, I don't think so either and and the way she did it too was was exceptional i think that's very difficult to do you know and i also think that you know the the lineup of girls in that 55 division literally is the best in the world like there wasn't a lot of uh people you could have changed into that division obviously fion is the one that everyone talks about um oh the call think, out bro the yeah, call out yeah I, I think if if adele hadn't beaten be a mosquito Okay, there might have been a bit of a, like a, uh, okay, is she the best in the world or is she not? You know, because uh, of Thea not being there. But the fact that she beat Bia the first time she ever fought her uh, in the final of the Open, you know, there's so many factors that go into that besides just those two squaring off, you know, that that puts her in that, I believe, that pound for pound spot. I mean, I'm, I'm biased, but that's what I, I think, you know. I don't think it'll be repeated. Um I think she's very much has the ability to, we spoke about this with Mo and I don't know if I'm, I'm supposed to talk about it or I don't know. I don't care. We'll, we'll, Whatever bro. We'll do, share with us. Share with us. We'll do the super fight next time and her division, you know, try and Gordon Ryan up in here um, and, and get another two <laughs> Ooh, and, yeah. get, and get another two, you know, and man, I think she has the ability to, to transcend a sport. I also think she has the ability to be the greatest uh, grappler uh, on the planet, regardless of male or female. Um, you know, and I think she has some, some things that will really help her, uh, like I said, transcend the sport. You know, we talk about her persona, you know, she is gay openly and she will not make, uh, any excuses for that. Should I say, even though I try and, uh, turn her and her, her partner all the time, they're, they're not for it, but you know, her ability to, <laughs> her ability to, uh, to, to talk to people on every level, you know, her, abil her ability to, to relate with kids, her ability to re relate with females, her ability to relate with males, her ability to relate with people who feel like they're uh, a minority. It, it transcends your normal athlete. You know what I mean? I think she has so many options now of what she wants to do. And she's still super humble, man. Um, she's still super humble. She'll, I think she's terrible at telling time because she'll call me at like 6 a.m. in the morning not knowing that, you know, I'm still in bed. And she'll just be like, I hope you have a great day. And I'm like, yeah, well, you just woke me up. So probably not. Thanks. 
Mate, yeah. look, such a phenomenal thing. Thank you so much for making the time to talk to us, mate. Is there anything that you that you want to uh, kind of leave off on? Like, is there any kind of uh, final message or thoughts that you'd like to share with people coming from your experience as a coach, as an athlete? Yeah. Um, anything like that? Yeah. So, like, obviously, the the episodes. Uh, spoke a lot about you know what what was achieved as a coach as an athlete as a father as any of these different hats the way that i look at it and the way i think everybody should look at it especially if you're australian is that door's open now like you can do it like we just showed you that you can do it that it it is possible okay yeah adele is talented but she has a work ethic that is insane and she never uh she didn't have that from birth you know she's she's fostered that over time so you could do it surround yourself with the right people ask questions constantly be open-minded take advice take coaching advice seek out coaches you know what i mean strength and conditioning coaches like yourself nutritionists jiu-jitsu coaches performance coaches whatever you know leave no stone unturned if that's what you really want to do you know like it is possible if you really want to do it you know what i mean and i think that's the biggest thing is for me is like when my daughter gets to an age where she understands what has happened you know i can show her hey look this is what dad did to help someone achieve something exceptional you can do that too you know what i mean and i think that's so important for people is is just to understand that you don't have to come from a super team you don't have to be living in america you do not have to be moving to brazil as long as you do the right things and you surround yourself with the right people you can achieve what you set out to achieve yeah that's awesome man really appreciate you making the time man and sharing those insights with us man Thanks a lot, Jake. We appreciate it, bro. No, thank you for always supporting, you know, not just myself, but uh, Adele and the, the other athletes that you do and building this community that really is just guiding people and showing them uh, the right way. And, you know, you guys probably don't get as, as much uh, praise as you deserve, but, you know, you've always got our support and, and we really appreciate you. You legend. Hey, mate, where can um, where can people find out more about your mentorship and you know, yeah. like what do you got going on? Yeah, Can you so, give some plugs? Yeah, so my Instagram is pretty is probably the busiest. If you guys want to send me a message there, it's got links to my mentor programs and my Patreon on there as well. Uh, my Patreon's a little bit different. I do share technique stuff, but it is very much focused on growing athletes and uh, guiding them and things like that. So definitely check that out if you if you got a, a chance to do that. Uh, if you want to work with me, send me a message. I'm not going to guarantee that that we will, but if if it's not me, I can definitely point you in the right direction. Um, and if you're ever in Perth, Essence Jiu Jitsu is my gym. Everyone's always welcome. Uh, it's a very friendly gym. It's a very friendly environment. We're not uh, a competition gym where you're going to come and get beat up. We do not do that here. I don't accept that here. We very much just about everybody enjoying Jiu Jitsu. Of course, if you want hard training, we have that as well. But it's a side uh, side project of what uh, Essence really is, and that's just a good culture and community. Nice. So epic, mate. Thank you. No worries. Awesome, brother. Thanks so much, Jake. Appreciate you, man.